Can I do mine again? I felt like I wanted to do it again. We should do a show. We should do a show. Twice, a.k.a. Two Weeks in Creative Endeavour, shares the stories, insights and journeys to now of creatives, innovators and social enterprises making a positive impact on society from Wellington, New Zealand. I'm your co-host, Jennifer Sullivan, and pleased to be joined by my co-host, David Vinstead. There you are. Hey, how hey, you doing? I'm good, how are you? Yeah, you're really good. We're really grateful for episode support from Biz Dojo, Collider Wellington, our Patreon patrons, and um, usually breweries, but on this occasion, we're having a dry episode. Our episode number 48 focus is the arts and theatre, encompassing writing, performing, producing and directing, marketing and partnerships. Both of our guests are deeply involved with delivering live performance awesomeness in Wellington and uh, to New Zealand and worldwide festival audiences. Both are alumni of Toy Fakari, New Zealand's foremost national drama school and are recipients of numerous awards and accolades. Introducing our first guest who devotes her professional life to the arts and theatre as a performer, producer and director. As artistic director, she leads Barbarian Productions, an independent Wellington-based theatre live art company dedicated to making fierce, funny and countercultural performance and media. A dedicated local traveller, enjoyer of natural hot pools and the New Zealand backcountry, two weeks in creative endeavour, really pleased to welcome the cultivated optimist who is Joe Randerson. Nice to see you, nice to be here. Our second guest is also deeply involved in Wellington Arts and Theatre, with performing, producing and directing credits stretching over nearly 20 years of professional practice. Recent roles include marketing and sponsorship for the Biennial New Zealand Festival from 2008 to 2016, subsequently joining the team at Bats Theatre in Wellington as Programme Manager. A committed pop culture quiz whiz, horse tricker and dedicated world traveller, apart from Portugal, Two weeks in creative endeavour, pleased is pleased to welcome the cynical romantic who is Heather O'Carroll. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Jen, you have your fingers in so many pies, I, know. I just can't even keep up. And then I serve up those pies. Yeah, it's a good time. There's a good side about being friends with people, but yeah. it can work the other way as well. And yeah. I think it's just good to be aware of that, like how and when to have professional, professional boundaries. And yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, get, I, go, I get on the bus and people I hear people going, hey, I've got a show to pitch you. And I'm like, oh, cool, just getting on the bus. Well, can we talk about that over email? That'd be really yeah. awesome. Thanks. Please no, Bye. not now. Please no. Yeah. <laughs> I knew someone who recognised a woman the other day and she was going, how do I know you? How do I know you? And then she realised it was a woman who did her pap smears and she was like, oh! Oh, <laughs> oh I had that with a, a woman I used to go get a wax from, a bikini <laughs> wax from. And she was friends with a friend of mine, but she turned up to look at my flat once because I was looking for a flatmate and I opened the door and I was just like, oh my God, this is really embarrassing. Did you deal with it here? Um, did you say something or did you just... It was totally fine. She actually did move into the flat and I made this joke like, oh, maybe you could just give me a bikini wax in the lounge and she was actually really up for it I was not <laughs> so up for it um, but yeah no she's just she was just like that's fine that's totally fine I was like I'm yeah maybe not that's fine yeah. <laughs> so I would go and see her in a in like in a room rather than like you know just at home it was weird it was weird I don't know why I, uh, I'm just going to sit here for the next hour and a half <laughs> and just leave this band. laughing quietly <laughs> and also sitting slightly uncomfortably. It's perfect. <laughs> perfect. perfect. <laughs> I'm wearing a Nope tea, sis, um, Nope Sisters tea right now. If anyone doesn't know about the Nope Sisters, go and check them out because they're really cool. Can you just give a very quick overview of what is BATS and what does it try and focus on? So um, BATS has been around now for almost 30 years, so we're celebrating our 30th anniversary in 2019, um, and that's it, BATS as it is now. So before that it had a, um, another whole life, rich, colourful, amazing history um, being different things, but um, we, in 1989 when uh, the two Simons, as they're known, Simon Elson and Simon Bennett, took it over as BATS as it is now, um, it's been operating as a, a theatre, and it's always had the same Kopapa Butch is really to provide um, accessible um, space uh, for new work, um, predominantly New Zealand work, um, from a wide range of practitioners um, and with no cost up front that you can try anything out there, that you can put anything on that you that you want and, um, yeah, and have an experience that's unique. So, yeah. That's really what Bats is. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a venue. Bats very really puts on its own theatre as such. Like it commissions a stab. 
Yeah, yeah. so we, we accept pitches from people. So people will say, hey, I want to put on this show. And we sort of help them through the process of putting that show on, depending on their experience level. So we get people who are really, really fresh and have never performed in a professional theatre before. Um, then uh, the total other uh, flip side of that, we get really experienced people who... Um, who have been doing something for a while maybe and they want to try out something completely different in a different context so they come to us. Um, but it's also just it's, the accessibility of it means that, you know, everyone can put on something at bats um, and it just is determined now by space <laughs> and time. Um, yeah. Two amazing guests, both involved with the experience economy, in effect. What is the state of the experience economy in Wellington and New Zealand at the moment, Heather? So the new building has allowed us to um, have three theatres that are going most of the time. Um, so, you know, there's a huge amount of output and there's no shortage of people wanting to fill spaces at BATS. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a really, th- it's a really thriving environment. And I think the cool thing about BATS is that we don't, um, we don't really have any barriers to people performing there and we also don't have any um, barriers to the type of work that we put on there you know we have an open pitching policy so anybody can put on work there about anything and the more diverse the better which is really exciting you know some um, theatres I think around New Zealand have very sort of strict guidelines about who their audience are and um, and what they will see and what they won't see, you know, but at BATS it's really exciting that you can see something different every single week um, and you can have completely different people in week to week, which is really cool. So it sounds like, so BATS, if I'm understanding the experience economy right, BATS uh, facilitate, BATS is sort of audiences or engagement of the experience economy is with people who provide experiences and then BATS facilitates those yeah. whereas what you do a lot more apart from you know Vogelmorn uh, being a venue for rehearsal that's still that's engaging with creators but a, in a different way more like because you you sort of help them from the other direction and you make your own work from the other direction. Yeah we run a this beautiful club the Vogelmorn Bowling Club um, which is a suburb that we live in which is interestingly interestingly not even a suburb anymore we're halfway between Vogeltown and Mornington and it was Vogelmorn and then the council decided that actually that area wasn't really a legitimate area so everything's still called Vogelmorn but it's not um, it's not real um, so anyway we have Perfect. this old bowling club yeah. yeah we love it I think that's why it's a great creative venue because it's a transitional space in that way um, and yeah it's a it's a place that's used as a community centre but also um, has a really strong focus around creative arts so a lot of rehearsals happen there and yeah as you say Jen we're really keen to support the development of work so one of the issues that I think there is um, is that there are a lot of venues in the city there are very accessible venues like um, Heather Runs called BATS but there are also a lot of venues that um, are not used um, because either people can't afford to get into them um, or they're booked out for other events. So how how and where do we make our work? That's a, a central question, I think, at the moment. And you're going back to your question, David, about the experience economy. Um, yeah, I think people are really hungry for experiences at the moment. And I think that the live experience has so much to offer and sometimes I think theatre has not grasped how broad our skill set is there and I see uh, people heading into I guess live experience um, sometimes with way less skill than a lot of people from theatre have yeah. and I, I see theatre not always picking up on that opportunity and I would want to yeah or being like we're going to keep and I think we should make plays and shows inside theatres but we also have so much scope to use theatre you know theatre came from being outside on the street so and it's interesting now because there's these new um, like now more and more opportunities are come up coming up to entertain the, the rugby fans you know like hey could you come up with a 20 minute piece this was a classic one the other day that will entertain the fans as they walk to the stadium <laughs> and then a different one as they walk home three and a half hours later and you're like they don't want to watch theatre on their way home <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but if we could, but maybe there's a cool, well, I was trying to get a social I mean, they put the fan in. zone right outside yeah. Circa and just absolutely, you know, yeah. the noise from the fan zone was interrupting the shows in the theatre. Like it's, yeah. It's yeah, great. that's right. It's good consideration both but ways. But, you know, <laughs> we are, creative people are opportunists and entrepreneurs. And so I am 
always curious why we're so good at taking risks inside the rehearsal room and making brave choices, but we don't do that in more of a business level or on a form level. You know, we actually follow quite conventional practices. Um, and I so I right now I'm quite passionate about that there's a huge amount of opportunity that we're not really picking up on. Some people are, um, and, and we'll get there, but I just think it's a solve, actually, for the poverty artist dilemma. Absolutely. But I yeah. think artists need to really upskill. Well, that's why we've been doing that course. It's taken this really great course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also what you were saying um, in the spin-off article that you were talking about, how, you know, um, businesses are using artists all the time. Um, you know, for creative for creative input and all of that sort of stuff. But, you know, it's not working the other way around. It's not. Yeah. yeah. OMG. And it is <laughs> classic. <laughs> yep. um, I can't remember what I was talking about. That spin-off article. But there was one where we were helping people run this new workshop. Yeah. And um, they're really wanting to use theatre skills and they're, they're asking for that. And then they go into trying to use them and really stumble over quite basic things that you learn in theatre like they're like oh I sort of realised that you need to like warm up or something like or I had a funny feeling after I stopped performing and then I went into facilitated discussion you know this guy saying like what what is that I was like oh well that's like there is a we have processes and rituals around and absolutely make up your own like not trying to say this is how you do it but yeah I agree I really think that people are um, yeah from the other side people are heading into this territory and I I want theatre to fight out there a bit more and go like hey we're live we have well you're really good at that Jen you know like you have live skills you're good at listening you're good at improvising those are really sought after skills in lots of other contexts yeah I I did a um do you guys know about Women Who Get Shit Done? The yes, unconference. I just joined that. Oh my gosh. Oh, did you just apply? I just applied. Yeah. Joe, you should apply. It's amazing. Um, cool. It's an unconference. It's happening uh, in Levin in September, I want to say. Yeah. Uh, but I went to the first one and basically, you know, you all just throw out your offers of what you want to run a session on. And I ran a little session on improv and I had about a dozen women come along and just basically played some games with them for about 20 minutes that were just about. Um, being okay with making mistakes and and being okay with looking a bit silly because if everybody is yeah you know getting on the same page that you all understand that you're there to make each other look good and you're there to try and succeed together and it's okay to make a mistake along the way and then just we sat down and talked about it for a while and all of them just like like one of them was like a surgeon and another was a I can't remember the other jobs but I just remember the surgeon and being like oh my god you're really impressive um but, you know, they're all just like, oh, yeah, these are really th- great things to remember that I can make mistakes and it's fine and that it's actually a lot easier to be comfortable if I'm okay with that than trying to protect myself from making a mistake and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And a kind of flexibility as well. Um, and an, another example I'm just thinking of is this in this experience economy, um, one thing we sometimes work at big parties for our clients and um, in this new virtual reality world which is great and I think there's a great place for you know live and performance work to to um, you know play alongside that um, but when we do these parties for people who work in those more virtual worlds they are so blown away by the live performers and I feel like oh my goodness like I just yeah we hired someone who's a really good performer but we just got it crappy costume from yeah. the costume cave and they did like a sort of <laughs> shitty Russian accent and you're like wow this is amazing yeah. because, they because they're taken day, out of their like they normal build re- they work really hard to yeah. build creatures that look real and then they see someone real and they're just buzzed out yeah. by it do, 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 you not, do you not think that this is the problem of society has become to an extent so dumbed down that anything a little bit different or unusual from that just blows their minds because they're so used to being sort of spoon-fed let's just call it content but also pre-packaged content you know content that has been edited and you know had the sort of the life sucked out of it in a way sometimes you know it's just it's it's there's nothing live about it there's nothing tangible about it there's nothing in your face about it anymore um you know so when you are confronted with a real life person who is doing something and they're making it up or you know people can't kind of get their heads around that sometimes they're just responding to something that's happening in the room even if they are following a script absolutely whether that's you or the person behind you or you know yeah and it's it's really interesting. I mean, I find it really interesting when people kind of freak out about audience participation, you know, and they like that, like it's, it's the number one fear of, of most people. And yet I've seen so many amazing experiences where the, the, 
you know, the environment has been created to such a way that people will just jump up on stage and like be part of something. Um, and it's transformative. Um, I mean, I remember seeing every brilliant thing uh, in Edinburgh, which was a show that came to the New Zealand Festival last year. And it was a show about uh, depression. It was about a young boy whose mother was attempting suicide and was very depressed and um, he decided as a young boy he was going to make a list of every brilliant thing in the world um, and everybody in the audience got a piece of paper with one of those brilliant things and a number and during the show they were asked you know number one and that person had to read what that brilliant thing was and number two and went around the whole audience but then he would also pull people out of the audience to play part, uh, characters in the play and I remember this one moment where he got this guy out of the audience and he said and, and then my dad gave the most amazing father of the bride speech at my wedding and I couldn't believe it and he just looked at this guy and the guy just looked at him and he went well dad and the guy just turned to the audience and gave this amazing impromptu father of the bride speech and it was like the most um, well father of the groom actually now I'm thinking about it um and it was the most beautiful moment and by the end of it everyone was in tears everyone was like but felt like they'd been part of something it's about priming them for for being ready to engage in that way yeah and I, I was just thinking when you were talking about audience engagement I was thinking I bet stand-up comedy has got a lot to to um apologize for in terms of scaring audience away from yeah. that sort of interaction thing just the number of times that people come to improv shows and I'm just like, you can sit at the front. We're, we're not going to be mean to you, I <laughs> promise. Yeah. Like, it's not stand-up. Just sit in the front. Because quite a few people are having a dry July, which we fully support, um, we've just picked a couple of non-alcoholic beverages to, to give a try. So what we've got here is Aotea um, Kumaraho and Ginger Native Leaf Infusion. Uh, this is a super light and refreshing native herbal infusion inspired by traditional Māori herbal remedies. We brew the native kumaraho leaves with fresh ginger and turmeric root. Mm. Yeah. No fake flavours, concentrates, preservatives or processed sugars, but just some fancy tea. Basic. Mm, yeah. Kia ora. Cheers. Cool. Yes. Kia ora. Awesome. I'm just smelling to start with. can definitely smell the turmeric, which I'm a big fan <laughs> of. Very good for... Muscle mm. aches, turmeric. Mm, is it? Yeah. yeah. You could good. boil it down in a tea. I'm just smelling all the ginger. ginger. Yeah, that's good. Oh, it's got a little bit of a sort of hits the back of your throat, a bit of a kick. Oh, like a little, yeah, sort a little, of a hot, little burny little tingle. Yeah. It's a little tingle. Yeah. yeah. Is that the ginger or what? Yeah. yeah. I think that's the ginger. Mm. Yeah. This is good. What I like about this is that it is not sweet. Like no. Often, mm. if you want to have a refreshing beverage, <laughs> um, the options are all juice options. And there is this crazy thing going on with sugar at the moment. I have two sons, and whenever they go to their grandparents, we have a big fight about sugar. So I really like this because um, it's a refreshing, as it says, it's light and refreshing. Yep. True, accurate description. It is what it says on the label. But it's not too sweet. So I would ch I would choose this as an option. It says no fake flavours. It's got like bush that. honey. Yeah, because we like some sincere honey. drinks. Yeah. yeah, we don't want anything fake. fake. No. Hey, let's just quickly round out with our refreshment number one. Oh, yeah. Maybe Heather first. Well, I have to say that um, my first impression was that it's kombucha. And I have this weird anti-kombucha thing just because I've had flatmates who ferment stuff and I just find it a bit weird. But that is not a slight on anybody who is out there fermenting stuff. I just don't like the smell in the cupboard. Um, but this is nice. This is not kombucha is it it's like tea i like it it's good i would say three just because like you david i would prefer some bubbles how about you joe i'm gonna just come in with a four and a half i like that it's new zealand made i like the non-sugariness of it and i like the slight tang how about you jen i'm also going for four and a half because that was really tasty and i don't usually like ginger but that was very drinkable, um, and yeah, I like. And I've still got that little like peppery tingle in my mouth, and I really like it. It doesn't. It doesn't feel yuck. It feels real nice. Yeah, good stuff. New Zealand tea. Like it. I like it. What's your score? The only thing I'm reeling from at the moment. Yeah. Is the wit and the humour in the conversation, <laughs> and I'm oh, loving David. it. <laughs> Stop it. Thank you. <laughs> As opposed to what usually happens with these time, type of drinks, where it's like the sugar hits you, and in 20 minutes' time, I'll be in like a coma on the floor. Oh, yeah. No. Um, so I'm very happy with the brew. I'm going to go four and a half as well. 
checking in briefly to tease apart the purpose of, well, purpose. Our purpose is capturing and sharing the stories of interesting people, delving into their journeys to now and striving to reveal future-focused opinions and perspectives on building a better, more people-centric and sustainable society. BizDojo's purpose is to create and facilitate communities of talented, interesting and clever humans who are pursuing their passions through a network of co-work venues countrywide. From humble beginnings eight years ago, the dojo now has six communities full of creatives across New Zealand. With flexible options for small and large teams and monthly contract-free plans starting from 399 New Zealand dollars, ride with purpose over to bizdojo.com, B-I-Z-D-O-J-O.com and at bizdojo on Twitter and Instagram to find out more. A grateful thanks to BizDojo for their support of this show. Can I just take you back a little and just ask you first, Joe, if you don't mind, how, how did you get started out in this? Did well, When did you first know that this is what you wanted to be? When I went to university, I had no idea what I wanted to study. And from my school, there was, I remember going to all these careers counsellors and it was if you're smart, you should be a lawyer or a doctor. And my sister was a doctor and she said, you're not allowed to be a doctor. Um, <laughs> you always copy everything I do. Um, so I did want to be a psychiatrist, but then, um, I don't know, the long years of study, I didn't feel I could commit to. There were too many other things that I was interested in, so I just studied a whole lot of broad stuff. And then I did a theatre paper and it was pretty much like, I just dropped everything. I think I was majoring in Latin, and then I just switched my major over to theatre. Because Latin is actually not that useful in today's world. Um, Seriously? <laughs> no shit, shit. Um, it takes me a while to figure things out sometimes. But, um, yeah, so then it was sort of a, just a, a, a wild sort of non, non-stop ride of just following something that I loved for, I don't know, seven or eight years or something without really asking any questions. It was just, I did it and loved it. And then, yeah, probably in my late 20s, I started to wonder, to really ask myself serious questions about that precariousness that you're talking about. Um, and and also about the value of it. I think that was a big question for me. It's such an indulgent medium, possibly. Um, is this something that I really want to put my time and energy into when I could be doing other things that maybe make more of a difference? Um, but I about faced on that when I met a cool company called The Circus Ronaldo, and I just saw how much joy they brought to family audiences. Like They played night after night to pack crowds, and I would see grumpy people lining up waiting to get in and see... It was like the star on star off machine or something, you know, it just total transformation when people become out. I was like, wow, this is really tangible, this change. Um, so yeah, that I, sh- I shift and then I think I kind of committed a bit more. It's like, I do want to do this, but I do want to make a difference with the work that I'm doing. Um, and maybe came, became a bit more socially, social justice focused. Um, and also I had two kids and it was like, well, this is, if you're going to do this, it's got to work you know like I can't be in that um yeah in that situation of not being able to pay my bills so I think that's when I started getting a bit more business focused around it as well or being like this has got to work like I want to do my art but I have to be able to feed my family so yeah I think I've worked quite hard at that over the last four years and am now feeling really keen to help upskill our whole industry around this because yeah it is very precarious and the positive side of that is that it's free you know like there's no I can pretty much focus my energy on what I want to and if I decide that an issue is of importance to me I can focus our work towards that Um, so I feel very very grateful for that freedom and that autonomy but um, yeah the challenge is to get the bills paid which is the challenge of any person who is self-employed so it's not just the arts in that way um, but I do I have a lot to say about the way that um, arts models are based like I don't think they're very healthy models and they don't put the artist at the top or centre. Do you mind me asking what you see that is at the top of that tree if the artist isn't at the front of mind in terms of that um, structure what perhaps is sort of leading that structure and how could it change? I think artists could start to just redraw the redraw the structure. So for example, a lot of artists are underpaid for the work that we do and we don't 
push back on that. And arts institutions, I think, make the most of that. They love art and they love artists, but they know a lot of the time that artists are the last to be paid. And some funding authorities also will pay for any other part of the project but not an artist fee or will, qu- will, will quabble the most about that. So I think artists need to look to other professions like architecture, other design institutions and be like, how do you guys charge for your time? So my friend who is a sculptor, um, she now has a charging system, billing system, where she has a quite a high upfront first amount for the idea. And because often for her, she works really hard on the idea and I don't think artists w- realise. So a, a lot of the time, um, artists get asked to go and help brainstorm things and basically throw out all these awesome ideas that we should be charging. Like as my friend taught me, when they say to you, hey, do you want to come for a couple of free drinks and a cheese platter and we'll <laughs> bounce around ideas for a children's TV show? <laughs> what you oh say no. back to them is like, no thanks, I don't drink and I'm dairy free and my brainstorming fee is $150 an hour and I will see you there. But that's usually the... That's the that's the carrot, eh? It's experience. That's oh, right. I'll exposure. Give you the ex- exposure. Yeah. Are you People know, die it's of exposure. Like, it's yeah. It's so, so I awful. think we need to get a lot smarter around that. And then there are more institutions. There are a lot of arts institutions which are are fine. But again, yeah, trying to get back to your question of what is at the top of that. Um, well, maybe the longevity of institutions is at the top of that. And like, for example, um, what is the career trajectory like for ballet dancers, you know, who uh, have a great time while they're part of the Royal Ballet, but then then what happens to them? So us, I, I do think a lot of it comes down to artists to really think about how we want to have these things framed around us and then get loud. You know, we don't advocate for ourselves nearly as much as we should. Um, and, and I think the whole arts industry should be lobbying for greater funding. Do you think? Do you think there should be like a an artists and actors and thirty union? There's actors equity. Yeah. There's the New Zealand Actors Guild. There's the New Zealand Comedy Guild. Mm. Um, there's probably oh, there's APRA for musicians, but I don't know if that's really a guild as such. And I'm trying to vaguely. I'm I, I have dreams of there being some sort of improv community sort of thing, but at the moment we're sort of loosely 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 connected. Uh, but yeah, I love the idea of being like, hey everybody, what if we collectively said this is what it costs to hire corporate improvisers? This is what it costs to have an actor at your thing. Let's try not to undercut each other too much. Let's, you know. What about uh, like how in Europe, how they have um, old people's homes specifically for like retired opera singers and that? <gasps> no. That'd be great. Yeah. Really? It's a thing. There was oh that God. movie based on it. Quartet, so just one, was called? Just one, like one, one sort of retirement village just full of opera singers. Yeah. Do they sing? Can you still? imagine us being in a... Retirement village together, Joe. For thespians, Thespia- just like community theatre shows every week. Like, <laughs> all right, there. everyone. This week it's Hamlet. <laughs> Jen's doing Hamlet again. I'm doing Hamlet, everyone. <laughs> you can't, oh, you can't die. We've got a show on next week. <laughs> oh, and Hamlet <laughs> actually <laughs> dies. Yeah, Hamlet has a heart attack. Oh, oh my god, on stage. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> I'd like to take a short break to make a short homage to one of the greatest little cities anywhere on planet Earth. If world-class recreation, arts, culture and food aren't enough reason to visit or work here, Wellington also happens to be a Southern Hemisphere hub for tech, digital and creative industries. A city actively supporting your personal and professional growth to build world-class, future-facing companies. Collider Wellington is a monthly programme of events where fast-growing companies and clever ideas come to connect, converge and collaborate. Its purpose is connecting thought leaders, emerging entrepreneurs and inspirational experts to support the growth of the greatest little city on earth, Wellington, New Zealand. So learn something new, hang with some of the smartest people on the planet and access world-class intelligence. For all the deets, go to colliderwellington.com, that's spelt colliderwgtn.com. A grateful thanks to Collider Wellington and Wellington City Council for their support of this show. Heather, for you, looking way, way, way back into your childhood years. Oh, God. When, was it around then or was it much later that you thought you were going to have a, a career in the arts and theatre and event management? I think as a kid, as a young kid, it stemmed just purely from the fact that my mother had surprise twins after me. So, like, literally surprise twins. Like, she had one, and the doctor said, oh, I think there's another one coming. And she said, sorry, what What did you say? And um, And then, like, my whole 
and I was 18 months at the time and from that moment my whole childhood revolved around these boys um, because everywhere you go people love twins um, so they were constantly in the paper there's two of them they're so cool and they, they look, look like, the same uh, it's crazy so exciting it's, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> buy, but, buy one get one free yeah. basically yeah they were constantly in the paper they got to ride I, this is the worst moment they got to ride with Santa in the Santa parade while I just stood on the sidelines watching. I can see the simmering resentment right now. <laughs> so I think it was kind of like my, you know, plea for attention um, to get away from the twins, um, much as I love them. Um, and so that's where it sort of started. And I remember, but I do remember the, like, the actual moment when I went, oh my gosh, you can do this as a career. Like you can actually be an actor. And there was... Um, I was at the Gavit Brewster Art Gallery because I grew up in New Plymouth and um, it was the year that the Globe Centre in New Zealand had made um, curtains to go to the opening of the Globe, the new Globe Theatre in London. You mean like physical curtains that went over? Physical curtains okay. that now are in, in the Globe Theatre in London. And um, they had brought to New Plymouth some actors from Toy Fakari had never heard of that place before. Um, and they were doing scenes from Shakespeare in and around the curtains to show, show how they would have been used in the globe and blah, blah, blah. And um, I just kind of was like, wait, there's this mythical place called Toy Fakari where you can go and you can like actually learn to be an actor and you can do this as a career. And it was like the most exciting day of my life. And I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. So I had to go to university first because you couldn't get into Toy Fakari at that time until you were... 20? 20. So, uh, yeah, so I did a theatre and film degree at Victoria University and then I went to Toy Fakati for three years and then stepped out into the world to become an actor and I did that for about eight years professionally. I mean, I'm still an actor, kind of, part-time. I'm a part-time actor. and um, um, But then I joined the festival and it was like an, another whole amazing world kind of opening up because... Um, yeah, I'd always been really excited by things um, that was ha- were happening in Europe theatrically. Um, I was a total theatre nerd when I was uh, at high school. I actually had a subscription <laughs> to the Royal Shakespeare Company. I was probably like the only teenager <laughs> in New Zealand that had a subscription to the Royal Shakespeare Company. So I would get <laughs> Joe's horrified. Look oh at my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. So I would get programs... Uh, sent to me from the shows Um, like my Christmas and birthday presents were um, picked out of the Royal Shakespeare Company catalogue every year like tote bags uh, mugs (laughs) Jo is just beside herself Is your collection still around? Um, I don't I don't The nice photo you say you and your sort of aged Shakespeare tote bags (laughs) Yeah (laughs) but I remember very distinctly when I was at Toy Fakati going to see this show. No, it was just before I went to Toy Fakati and I went to see the show <laughs> at Downstage and it was a Shakespeare and they were using parachute silk and I remember just kind of sitting in the audience and rolling my eyes and going, <laughs> I mean the Royal Shakespeare Company did that like five years ago with this production, la la la. I was like this total know-it-all Shakespeare geek. Have you um, directed anyway, a lot of Shakespeare's? I haven't directed any Shakespeare's. But having said that, and this is not like a, an intended segue or a suck up or anything, but the the last show I saw before I went to Toy Fakati was The Lead Weight at Bats, which was a stab show written by Joe Anderson. I wrote it, yeah. He wrote it. <laughs> not Shakespeare. <laughs> not Shakespeare. Not no. Shakespeare. But this is this was a turning point <laughs> because I thought I would go to Toy Fakati um, to become those actors that I saw at the Vigip. Gavet Brewster Art Gallery, be a Shakespeare classical, like that was my that was my path. Do the proper acting. Do the proper bunny acting. Act, bunny ears around that. And then nice. I saw the lead weight and it just completely blew me away. It was the most amazing, like visceral, um, emotional, like just dark. Um, incredible play Um, and Bats was completely transformed into this old house, this old working house so there was running water a fish got cooked on stage Um, there were naked people everywhere like it just I I just remember seeing that and going I think that when I go to Toy Fakati when I come out that's what I'm going to do I'm going to do those shows and then in 2011 
they were doing a show of it at Circa. They were doing the lead weight. It hadn't been done professionally, I think, since then. And I auditioned and I got the part. So I got to do the play that kind of just made me, inspired me to come out of Tuipakati and take over the world. So that was really cool. Yeah. It, it does sound like quite a singular focus from quite an early age, though. <laughs> yeah. ha- however, it was inspired, dear twins. Um, <laughs> but all, all the way through to this point. And do you mind me asking, though, what, what was the imperative that has led to the shift from being a full-time actor to now being a part-time actor? Is it, uh, um, just a wild guess here, but is it financially based? Is it the need to get put food on the table or is it, is it something else? Yeah, I guess so. And I think it was, a, it was a really sort of slow, it was a slow transition. Um, like when I first joined the festival, I was on a very short contract. Um, and each time I went back, I got, I've got a longer contract and a longer contract. But it, um, it still allowed me in between those contracts to go away and do some shows and do acting and things like that. But then I just got more and more like excited by working in festivals. Like just the people you meet, the people you work with, just the whole the whole running, the whole kind of logistics it takes to put something like that together. Um, so basically then I was like, okay, well now instead of filling my time between contracts with acting, I am going to go and check out the biggest festivals in the world. So, um, I had been to Edinburgh in 2005 to work as an usher, just kind of, which was a great time. And in fact, Joe was there that year and we had some lols. (laughs) That was one of the best times ever. Um, and yeah, and that was really amazing. But then in 2014, I actually went back to the same place that I worked as an usher and actually worked in the marketing team and tried to learn how to sell, you know, like over a thousand shows in a festival to people. And um, yeah, and it, was do? Really, it, was, <laughs> it was really great. I remember the, what, the time that I was sitting outside with my manager and I said, I just, I mean, this is what I, why I came here to learn how you kind of, where's the, how do you find the cut through? Like, how do you get the audiences? Like, what, what do you do? And she was like, oh, you can't. And I went, cool, I'm going to have a great <laughs> time. <laughs> so then I just kind of did my work, saw lots of shows um, and had a really amazing time. But yeah, so it was kind of like, and also just the, 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 the one of the greatest things I love about my job is, so where I am now, which is now at BATS and the program manager, is because I'd been at the festival a really long time and I'd learnt all of the ins and outs of sort of the marketing and sponsorship and, and all of that. But I mean, marketing and sponsorship is all about what do people want? How can you give it to them? You know, what are their values in life? Um, do they align with yours? You know, what what psychologically do they invest in to um, come to your product, you know? And, and that really comes into sort of programming as well because, you know, you have to think about the financial side of it, but it's also just trying to kind of go, there's this thing, this is what the person is trying to say, who is going to receive that information? And I love making connections. That's the best part of my job. And also just, you know, people saying, I've got this idea, but I have this one like part missing. And I go, oh, I know somebody who can fill that part. So, you know, having that sort of collaboration um, thing, it's really great. Yeah. yeah, it's really it's quite nice when you can yeah be the be the you're like the the person who introduces people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I love facilitating that. other people being yeah. amazing as well. And I really love it when I go to things that aren't arts related, um, like you know those Wellington summits we've been to recently. You know, and you're sitting around a table with people coming from all different sectors, all different walks of life, and it's so cool how you can en- engage with people and and realize that you're all on the same page, and because we can be really arts focused. Yeah, I think the arts industry can be very insular and I like that we, uh, yeah, those cross-sector conversations that you're talking about um, that our new mayor has been hosting and I also think that often arts sit a bit on the edge, on the outside, like, oh, let's do our whole building and then let's get a little bit of art in the foyer, yeah. um, you know, rather than actually having creative thinkers on board in conversations as, um, you know, members of the community who have a valid perspective. Yeah. It's like it's like setting up the art where you go like, cool, we'll put a piece of art here and, the, and you design the building and the artist comes in and goes, actually, there's nowhere that the light's going to hit it right and it's going to look terrible here. It's going to look a bit <laughs> shit. If you'd brought me in earlier, yeah, maybe yeah. this wouldn't be so stupid. Exactly. Because I remember being at one of those things and um, having a woman from Sports Wellington or something and, you know, we were kind of talking about venues and we were talking about how that's a big issue and, and, at the end, and we kind of boiled it down and boiled it down and boiled it down and we went, and at the end of the day, 
it's a venue because it's not a venue. It's a place where people kind of have their well-being time. It's a place where people go to kind of mentally stabilize themselves, whether it's sport or whether it's the theatre. It comes down to people coming to a place to be social, to have an experience, to interact with other people and use it to like benefit their own mental well, health. I grew up in the church and that is yeah. exactly those things you're talking about. Um, my father's an Anglican priest, so that was why we gathered. We came together, people put on robes, they lit candles, a rudimentary form of lighting, but a kind of lighting. And um, <laughs> and there was a sermon, a long monologue, if you like. <laughs> um, and there was community and fellowship at the end. Yeah. Audience interaction. Audience interaction. Any That's right. No, you know, no, no participation. Hackling. You came up, had a bit of bread. Yeah. Um, a bit of wine. A bit of wine or fruit juice if you were under 10. Some singing. <laughs> but a singing, it was very yeah. participatory. Yeah. And yeah. Children's time. Children's it's time children's for kids. Time. And the kids go to their own entertainment. Break up your audience. But it's yeah. just about having a community. Yeah, And there is a time for a bit of reflection as well. Like mm. in a church service, um, I quite like some of the times when um, you do just listen to the music, like a nice piece on the organ. or And so because I think that is an important part of theatre, like there's entertainment, obviously, but also there is a chance to reflect on who we are as humans and what we're doing. Sometimes I wonder, just kind of coming back to your question a bit about this, what's at the top of the, the tree, David? Um, you know, I think that... Um, we choose security a lot of the time and I think arts should, like anything, have a spectrum, like not everything has to be activist, social justice, politically oriented, although that's where I prefer mm-hmm. to sit. You know, I also think go just pure entertainment and, um, but I do think that, especially right now, there is a real part to play for, for theatre to bring us back to who we are and that we're not just... It's not just a commercial structure. that. So I think sometimes that idea, that capitalist idea or that commercial structure is a bit at the top of the tree and us wanting to be part of secure institutions um, rather than necessarily um, challenging. Talk to me about risk. Because one of the things, Heather, you just touched on a little bit earlier was this sense that, um, I hate calling it a marketing game, but you've, you've pr- both pretty much summed up kind of the quandary that business exhibits or design or architecture they're all trying to get some people to do something uh, or buy a product and to create value and all the rest of it and both as a program manager and also as an artistic director joe and you've got this sense though you want to create challenging work and sometimes push some boundaries as well as some middle of the road and i doubt that you ever produce boring work Um, but you also want to put bums on seats you also need to pay the bills and i'm really curious headline risk how do you reconcile those two our whole business at bats is is based on risk we're a risk share we've got a risk share model so uh, that means we go into partnership with the artist and we say we are both taking a risk on this they pay nothing up front um so we're both going in we're giving them lots of support they're giving us this amazing thing that they want to you know, give to an audience, and um, and we're both kind of taking, you know, spitting on the hand and taking, shaking it, and going, cool, we're in this together, um, and whatever comes out of it comes out of it. Um, so yeah, so we really, um, we really know about risk, um, and I think it's, you know, it's really interesting going from being an actor and you know being sustainable as an actor and trying to support yourself and trying to find avenues um, to going into an organisation and being responsible for that organization like it's just a whole nother level of um you know because you do have to think about the 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 organization sustaining itself but at the same time you know obviously you want to make the work first and foremost um in your creative decisions so um you know it's just trying to find that balance and also you know we're so thankful for the funding that we get from um, CNZ and Wellington City Council and our amazing sponsors. There are lots of different ways. Um, there are lots of grants you can apply for and all of that. But I mean, that's a that's a whole business in itself. Just at, you know, on top of running a theatre, having to find the means to support it and the means to sustain it. Um, and it's yeah, and it's a consideration. But it's not my main consideration when I'm programming. Um, it's the idea. Yeah, you've got different risk things, right? You've got because you've got the risk of what you're doing creatively, and you've yeah. got the risk of what you're doing organisationally. Yeah, like how you make it, how you produce it, how you market it. Yeah, what you market, and it's it seems 
to me that like you kind of have to pick which where you want the risk to be. Yeah. Like if the risk is everywhere, then you're it's too much, too much risk because it's going to be a mishmash and how do you actually give that to an audience? Whereas if you go, you know what? Um, it's a calculated risk. Yeah, and it's a conversation we have with everybody who comes into the building. It's, you know, well, look at your costs, look at your ex- um, expenses, look at, you know, look at, I mean, it's, yeah, it's just always, it's always a balance. What about that great example of, I think, the Sydney Theatre Company who realised that they were making really big projects that were too big to fail, and I think one of them opened, and then it didn't do very well, and was like, well, now we've got this pro- this programme for like eight months, and... We've got nothing. They start up a new initiative, which is um, short turnaround shows. Six weeks before they went on air, uh, before they went live, they said, who's got a piece? Um, and people pitched for it. So people were pitching for something really current. And then you had, yeah, like four weeks to do it. And then you were on for a week. And the tickets were all $10. And um, it just absolutely sold out. And they made so much money over off it. And these are the kind of initiatives that I think are really smart. Like we do have to think futuristic and um, into the difference. But if we don't take these kind of risks that you're talking about, um, we're never going to open up new possibilities. And it seems a really smart business thing as well to try small risks. Yeah. Oh, I heard that bottle <laughs> opening. Who would fancy a second refreshment? It's by. The, looks like it's by the same the same lovely company. Sure is. Same people. Uh, I'd like to point out that we are not sponsored by them. <laughs> <laughs> but, although I will shortly be contacting them saying how good their stuff was. Do they want to sponsor some theatre? <laughs> <laughs> Here, everybody. Oh, here we go. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is. Kawakawa and peppermint. We brew the kawakawa leaves with peppermint, nettle and chamomile. Yeah, it's pretty great looking. Again, it's got some bush honey. Water, kawakawa, nettle, peppermint, chamomile, lime juice. A little lime juice in this one. There was a little lemon juice in the other one. This one's very refreshing because of the peppermint. Well, I can't I can't really taste the peppermint directly. Can you? Yeah, I can taste it. I feel like I can smell it more than I can taste it. I love peppermint. Yeah. But I can't taste it in this. <laughs> What's wrong with me? You, you eat too much peppermint. You've, you've built up a resistance I think I've got to a it. resistance to peppermint. <laughs> oh yeah, that's um, that's also refreshing. Mm. Like the other one. Yeah. Super light. I like how they call it super light. I like its cloudy texture. I'm just doing a little appearance thing I here. I like that. You're doing a little spot. Yeah. It's almost like cloudy apple juice, it looks like. Um it's got nice body in it. You got to you got to shake it up to get the stuff to 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 spread around. I've been pleasantly surprised by both of these brews. Yeah. Refreshments. Do you have an office at Vogel Mort? Is that where you base yourselves, or do you work from home? Well, our home is two doors away from yeah. our office. I know, which is but good. It's still, it's still. A different... But we do try to make the psychological shift um, down to the office, and um, yeah, we mainly base there. It's quite good. We've just opened a commercial kitchen in there too. <gasps> great. So mm. now we've got all these people buzzing That's around, great. working on the kitchen, mm. and we're like doing art stuff upstairs, and it's a nice balance of different people. Yeah. Just um, just tell me when you would find yourself drinking this in the future, if it's something you favour, Heather. Um, well, it's very refreshing, so I feel like um, it would be a good summer drink. Yeah. yeah. Out on the deck. I don't have a deck, but if I did have one, I would definitely be drinking this on the deck. I would have it at, say, a gallery <laughs> opening. Of say a successful American artist um, oh. or European artist, well any artist really. I'm just trying to give a little bit of colour to the <laughs> image. But um, no, I I just I often think at openings or arts events or any sort of event, there's often a lot of alcohol and then there's juice and water, and um, it would be really nice to have an option like this that you could have something that was a little bit special and didn't have alcohol in it. Yes. What? This doesn't have alcohol. What? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's peppermint. Oh, yeah. It's also astringent, mm. but it makes your breath smell nicer. Jen, where, where does this sit in your grand lexicon of uh, refreshments? I feel like I would drink, I'd, I'd drink this during a show, while watching a show at Bats. Just saying, if you wanted to stock this at Bats. Yeah, that's a good idea. It, it does feel like a nice, uh, It's gosh, it's a hot day, I need something from the fridge. Oh, that looks yum. But this is really tasty. I just want to, I just want to. Like drink the whole bottle. Okay, so I drank this with a chutney sandwich. Just chutney in the sandwich. Chutney and cheese sandwich. A ploughman's? Yes. Oh, ploughman's lunch. Oh, man. <laughs> Stop talking about food. I'm really <laughs> hungry. I'm <laughs> hungry. Yeah. I've got leftover pad thai at home. I'm going to eat that. Yeah. We should get around to some final scores. Oh, yeah. 
Well, I'm going to go first and I'm going to give this a 4, which is 0.5 less than the last one. But that's just because personally I'm not massively into chamomile. So that, yeah, it's just something about the chamomile combined that's not quite tipping it over the edge for me. Fair enough. Yeah. Solid. Uh, um, I'm thinking 4.7. I didn't used to do points. Now I'm doing. S- wow! S- I know. So I like this better than the ginger one, uh, even though it smells weirder. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, it's a confusing peppermint chamomile smell, but it tastes really good. So I feel like if I was drinking it from a bottle, then I couldn't smell as much of it as I can out of a glass. I'd be fine. Yeah, I like how you consider other situations of the drinking and your grinding. It's, it's, it's a part good. of it. It's part of it. I'm gonna go with an image on my score. Yes, please. Uh, I'm gonna go with. It's you're staying at a um, at a, a batch or a holiday house for overseas listeners, um, or or somewhere, and you, and you decide to go for a walk on the beach. And it's not a really sunny day, but it's just nicely overcast and and mild, and that's a really nice kind of day for me. Um, is there much wind? There's just a really really mild breeze. Oh, good. And it's warm. Is it a warm? It's a warm breeze. breeze. Yeah. So the the waves are kind of gently lapping. Just lapping. Yeah. And there's this piece of driftwood oh, that looks nice. like you're dead. And we're sort of talking uh, sl- slightly crumpled linen shirt. You got it. Yeah. Go, yeah. David's all over level it. One person like on a horse <laughs> who's just, just riding one, yeah, down the beach. Down. So is, is it just Fabio? A, a rogue is horse. Fabio riding down the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Heather. Well, oh, shoot. My rating. I forgot all about that. I was thinking about the commercial we were making. That's um, the power of images. It is. Um, I am going to up it from a four because I like this one more. I like the peppermint. Yeah. We are working hard out on a hut winter festival at the moment. So the hut is a beautiful area just north of Wellington. Um, and it includes Petone and Stokes Valley and Taita and Nainai and Wainui Amata. Um, and many other areas as well. So it's a really cool area of New Zealand and we have been commissioned, Barbarian Productions have been commissioned to curate a festival out there which showcases the work of local artists um, and has a lot of community artwork. So I just, uh, before I came here, was rehearsing with a cool group of people called Thumbs Up who are people with intellectual and physical disabilities at a little studio out in Petoni and they've all made these beautiful big sea creature puppets and we had a practice with them to their music of choice which was the Macarena which gave me a lot of joy oh, so I was inside yes. a, a tuna or eel puppet <laughs> and I'm um, dancing to the Macarena it was really that's great a blast from the past that's a blast from the future um, which yes. is when the festival will be happening <laughs> in two weeks it happening, starts on Joe? the 15th it's about eight yeah. days and it's been really cool for us to get to know lots of people working out there um, and yeah, really looking forward to it. It has that kind of slightly um, less known quality to it, which I really like when you're working with community groups because um, people just, uh, changes seem to happen faster and things fall through and people drop out, but then some amazing guitar group suddenly pops up who want to have a slot. Uh, so I like that kind of improvised <laughs> quality to it. Yeah. So we've got a really nice website, hutwinterfestival.co.nz. And, um, really, really, yeah, I was really enjoying the website. Thanks. It'll be in the show notes. Yeah. Any particular memorable rewards that you feel that you get from working with especially community groups? I just really enjoy, um, as opposed to a professional working world, where sometimes people can, I think it's important to have boundaries but sometimes that whole financial transaction between you all can mean that people can be a bit distant so sometimes you talk to people who are part of shows that they actively diss you know and I always think oh this is strange to me that you're well I have really high values around that personally about what what you participate in Um, but I feel like when you work with people in uh, communities people are genuinely there because they want to be doing it um, and they just often find it um, they bring their all to it and that includes all of their disagreements with things as well whereas sometimes in a professional context people won't tell you face to face that they're not happy about something Um, so I love that, I love the surprise I think when you were talking Heather earlier about uh, what people can do in the moment in the participatory theatre moment without realising um, people are so creative and so um, have, have so much to offer when you give them some free space to explore something. So I just kind of love the surprise of what comes out of that. 
Joe, you've got a show upcoming at Bats called Soft and Hard. Before you tell me about it, just tell me how the name came about, the title. We were thinking about um, qualities that are seen as female qualities and qualities that are seen as male qualities. And obviously there are more than just those two binaries in gender. Um, But hardness is often seen as such a positive attribute and... um, you're told to go hard, get aggressive. I was just at a talk yesterday from a guy who was advocating that is the only way to succeed in business is to be really hard and really aggressive. But as we know, there are also ways um, that only gentle, <laughs> only a gentle touch, um, things that only a gentle touch can a- achieve. So, yeah, we're working a lot around those two, um, those two words. It's got a giant curtain in it, which is my most exciting. I heard about this curtain the, the other day. The curtain is I so great. Wait to say so um, <laughs> we like to start with a big object. So for me, it started around looking at gender posturing and the kinds of ways that I was being shown I should be behaving and holding my body as a woman. Um, and actually, funnily, I've been watching a few '80s movies recently with my son. We've been going through a musical phase <gasps> at home, like That's Grease great. and stuff like that. Fantastic. And sometimes I think the women were actually stroppier and more empowered in the '80s. By then, they just got really silenced through the '90s in um, early 2000s and even I just saw Wonder Woman and great kick-ass beginning I with lots of it. females fighting each other and then it just sort of turned into a male buddy war pick. It, it, isn't it fantastic? Sorry, as a complete aside, uh, Wonder Woman, a uh, huge box, box office success as well. Yeah, yeah. and she got paid $300,000, is that right? There's some, oh, I, apparently there's yeah. like yeah, I don't know. There's more info about that. <laughs> it's it's scale. not coming out. I know. Blah, there's a whole blah, scale. Blah, blah. And this is a tricky kind of point. We're yeah, adding yeah. lots of things in our society, I feel. But that there are things, it's great that that happened, but that also doesn't mean that we can't criticise that or yeah. suggest ways that it can improve. Totally. But at the same time, sometimes I feel like that voice, the critical voice is so strong. And we also need to be um, sure that we build on positive things that we're doing. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And I don't know that we have great examples of how to do that a lot of the time. Like leaders who can really back stuff and be positive about things and that that can be a graceful way to also say this wasn't so good. Yeah. We're really looking forward to being at BATS. I'm over that so week. looking forward to having you there. Heather, you were saying your first... Um, performance on a Wellington stage was in Young and Hungry. It was, yeah. yeah. And Young and Hungry opens next week. Young and Hungry opens next week. So um, we are in a maintenance week at BATS at the moment, so we're sort of like battening down the hatches and like cleaning everything and like painting everything and making it all pretty for the um, the overrun of 18 to 25 year olds that we'll have in the building from next week. Is it 18 or is it 15? 15 to 25 say. year olds. <laughs> 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 There are children in the building. Yeah, and it started at BATS. It was an yeah. initiative that was um, developed by the program manager at the time called Guy Boyce. And it's been going ever since. And it's just a really amazing opportunity to um, upskill young people and what it takes to put on a show. It's taking risks, right? It's taking, taking risks, risks on new – because they're brand new plays. Yeah. Um, the directors change up every year. So, yeah. you know, the directors are usually experienced, but they change it up. And yeah. the actors are generally – they're all – You know, they're 15 to 25. That's probably the first play. We ask all of our guests on twice, two weeks in Creative Endeavour, um, if there's an analogue object or item or thing that they, at the moment, can't live without. Joe, what would it be? Can I say my DVD collection? It's not exactly an analogue object. (laughs) 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 But I like to break the rules. But it is, but it is finite. Like, it's not, it's not like the internet or anything. But you need technology to make that work. Or do you just, like, fondle your DVDs? I get very affixed to particular objects, but they, they pass. Um, but I do have a lot of collections in my house. One of my favourite collections is of um, wood and twigs that have little plastic eyes glued to them. And oh, a little, that's so great! A little phrase in it, like, we're all nuts in here. Or oh. like, um, How many do you was, have? I have about 30 oh, and um, so I guess it's the homemade craft that someone just saw like a bit of driftwood or a pine cone and was like, oh, I can stick a couple of googly oh, eyes googly on Googly eyes, that. I was going to say googly eyes are Googly plastic eyes and then put yeah. a little funny. So I have, yeah. and, but I have a lot of collections at home. But when, when asked that question, like, what is your favourite? I, I find it hard to sort of pin one thing down because I, I kind of, something is really important to me and then I move on from it as a material thing. What about you, Heather? Well, yeah, we got, we got asked this question, and I said my bed, which is a really dumb 
thing to say. But I guess at the moment it, it just, oh my gosh, I, you know, this year has started off being so crazy. We've had like three festivals in quick succession and it's, you know, it's kind of made me just go, oh my God, like keeping up with everything. And, um, you know, it's been it's been so awesome. It's been amazing things that have come through Bats this year and I've managed to see most of them. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, it's made me pretty tired. But um, so my bed or else my friends, like just that's one of the most Your important things. Analog objects, your friends. Yeah, those old analog objects. I love it. There's an analog object. Isn't yeah, it? it is. I feel like those are uh, solid answers. You, you look like yeah. you're questioning yourself, but I think solid answers. Do you have any uh, shout outs to any any um, any things you like? A shout out um, the Wellington International Film Festival, which is starting soon in Wellington, and all the beautiful films that are going to be in that. Also, Marina Abramovich's uh, autobiography, which I just read which is awesome, um, and just, oh, George Saunders' book, um, Lincoln and the Bardo, is that what it's called? It's, I haven't heard of that, but it sounds uh, great. George Saunders is this incredible American writer who I just really love. Um, yeah, and Jessica Crispin's Why I'm Not a Feminist, A Feminist Manifesto. Those are my favourite books at the moment. I was watching uh, the new series of Veep, and I cannot get enough of that show. Like, it just gives me so much joy. We can find you through your company and organisation websites. Yep. Um, Barbarian Productions is the name of my company. And so we just have a website. Uh, also, the Vogel Morn Bowling Club, where we work, uh, has another, our own Vogel Morn community group website because we have lots of cool events that are happening there. We'll be doing some stuff, particularly coming up to the election. Um, we have a festival called Spring Uprising, which we do in September. Um, yeah, and I'm going to be more active on Facebook soon. When I had young kids, I just couldn't handle another platform. It was too many things to be checking all the time. But I'm coming back. Look out. <laughs> Virtual world. <laughs> You can find Bats at bats.co.nz where you can buy lots of tickets to Young and Hungry and Soft and Hard and all the other amazing shows that we've got coming up at Bats. And you can also find Bats on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And yeah, it's really cool. Bats underscore theatre on Twitter. And Jen, where can we find you online? Um, Jen Thinks Harder on Twitter. Um, and jenniferosullivan.com, but I haven't really done very much on that on account of being at school. But then later in the year, later in the year, I'll be we've got the festival-ing. Improv Festival happening at Bits. New Zealand Improv Festival is being October. programmed right now. It's in October, 14th to the 21st. Heard it here first. 15 shows in five days. Whoa. Yeah, all different. Well, mostly different. It's improv, so everyone will actually, there's no way it can be the same. So <laughs> <laughs> if we did it the same, you'd be like, what the hell just happened? But it is also organised. They don't just make up. A no, festival on the it's spot. It's calculated risk. Calculated the festival risk. is organised. The shows themselves are. We do everything so that when you get on stage, then the madness happens. Yeah, the magic happens. Sorry, magic, magic, yeah, that's, not that's madness. Yeah, good correction. <laughs> yeah, both. It's fine. Hey, uh, you can find Twice Podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Twice Podcast. Uh, we do have a website, twicepodcast.com, but you can also find us on your favourite RSS read or podcast app of choice if you listen to podcasts which if you're listening to this you do thank you to our supporters such as biz dojo collider wellington our patreon patrons and to our guests <laughs> our lovely guests joe randerson and heather o'carroll have you had a lovely time with us i've had a great time yeah i've had a really good time and like we're so busy we hardly ever get to hang out but oh, we should we're hang so out more busy we should hang out in large gray booths like this more this is really fun <laughs> i've had an amazing time lovely thank what would you, you so rate much. it <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to send anyone to the back of the class? Like People sent themselves there. Right. <laughs> yeah, they just right. knew that's where they belonged. It was self-selecting. <laughs> yeah. Team Theatre always sat at the front. This one was one they had at the film festival launch, Heather, a, like eco... Oh, I didn't get invited to that. Oh, <laughs> well, it was a really dumb night. <laughs> Good. Was it the worst? It was the worst thing I've <laughs> ever been to. <laughs> we did think about crashing it, but that's another story. Ah. Yeah. yeah, I love crashing I've actually parties. got. I've actually done a voiceover for a film that's in the film festival. And you didn't get invited. No, I didn't get invited, so Did that's you awesome. Do anything? No, you know what? The <laughs> film festival is one of those things in my life. I'm sorry to get off topic, but there's one of the things in my life where I circle a million films that yeah. I want to see, mostly documentaries. I really love mm-hmm. documentaries, and they're the ones that don't usually come back. And then I don't get the time to go and see anything. 
It's a terrible advertisement for the film festival, isn't it? What about aiming for like one or two? That would be really good. I think I should do that. Yeah. Because, yeah. you, you you know, maybe your ambition is sort of, you know, in the way there. Of yeah. Your, <laughs> that's my cynical romanticism because again. Yeah. I think I'm going to see 50 <laughs> films. And then and I then see none. And then, yeah. The website's amazing, though, like where you can, because I, I do a similar thing where I go, these are all the films I want to see. But yeah. then I sit down and kill time by going through the website and hitting like favourite on all the ones that I want to see, mm. and then I, and then it shows you like your wish list, and it goes, these are all the films, these are oh. all the places that overlaps. And does it so, give you like a schedule? Uh, yeah, and then you <gasps> so can it's go like through. A PA. It's, it's like a film it's festival amazing. PA. And then you go through and go like, well, I can't watch that, and I can't watch that, and then you compare it to your calendar and go, well, I can't watch <gasps> those, and then you're left with the ones that you could actually legit go to. Okay, That's I'm good. obsessed with this. This is what I'm going to do. It's really great. It. I need to see Jackie's film. Inland Road. Inland Road. Yep. Yes. That looks amazing. Yes, it's great. I've already seen it. Oh. Yep, just because I'm so here. So did you get invited to that? <laughs> so uh. last year. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, there's an Insiders Jackie... Film Festival that um, they wow. screen the one the year ahead. Anyway. New Zealand really Insiders Film Festival. <laughs> Festival, yeah. Jackie Van Beek. Jackie yeah, Van, Jackie Van, Van Beek has made a beautiful new film yeah. called Inland Road. It's her first feature. Mm-hmm. Um, she and directed. Yeah. She's she in it. directed she, oh yeah, and wrote it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. L- links in show notes all those past things the thing I was going to quickly say about your um, the fantastic use of technology is oh, yeah. do you come back to it in a month and then sort of berate yourself because you have a list of all the films oh. that you wanted to go to but actually missed no no I don't go back and look at it no, no. Okay. I just work it out and then if I if Never I look back no, David. no I try no, not no, to no, do I that hear. although I did I did just like yesterday sit down and clean out my drafts folder in my in my <gasps> Gmail. I had like sixty draft emails in there. Do you, how many do you have, Heather? <laughs> no, none. Like, none. No, I'm a very I have sort 10 of now. I'm sort of semi organised with my inbox. Like, how I many do you have, David? Never delete. Uh, two actually. Two drafts. Check, check today. What yeah. the hell? I Person. thought everyone had like six. I just had, to, and I was using it. I realised that I was using it to like save files. Like I was attaching files and then just not sending the email. So I had this enormous pile of things where I was like, I don't need any of this. What is that app that lets you know if your email is too passive? It's popular with women. If you're like, hey, I just wondered if maybe you might want to reconsider. <gasps> is this an email app? Yeah, and you, and it scans your email and says this is too um, passive. passive. Oh, oh my gosh, I need I that as well because I start every email with just wondering or just following up. Or You need to improve your draft and send it to me now. It makes you say things like that. <laughs> That's really, <laughs> really good. I like Direct. That. Yep. Do you know what's fascinating about that though? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we ever ask other people to soften their language? Like, hey, being a bit rude, maybe you could be nicer with your I emails. I did ask <laughs> a very famous writer to did soften you? his language, <gasps> and he bounced back so hard at me. <gasps> like, aggressive? Yep, Ugh. really aggressive at me. I was like, did hey, I did all this work for free on spec. I understand you don't want to include it in your journal now. Um, but I think it was really rude just to send me an email when I did all that work that just said, not going to publish it. That is super rude. That's and, yeah. very and rude. And he said, I, listen, I have checked out my email with another white male writer of my generation who thinks it is fine. Oh, well, that means... <laughs> oh, you, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, awesome. My mistake. Yeah. yeah. I'm really happy that you got sorry, that. Sorry, just me. Validation from Do somebody else. Do rejection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point, Jen. Why don't we ask people yeah. to soften things yeah. sometimes? Because yeah. we, always, we always ask women to go like, oh, you know how you need to be better at your job is to be more like men. And you're like, what if men were just less like that? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just saying. Just saying. There's a time to be hard yeah. and aggressive, and there's a time to be soft and gentle for all of us. Yeah. 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 Just consider I think it. The Bible says just that. Just consider it. Gotcha. <laughs> Something about planting and sowing, right? I, Sorry um, about that. Come I am details. today <laughs> learning so much just by sitting here. This is fantastic. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> but what about that lovely quote, which is, "The greatest cynics are failed romantics." Ah. So because I always think there's a relationship between the two as you're talking about you know like you're you're probably not just one or the other like maybe you develop quite a cynical attitude to protect your romantic um or sensitive self which Mm. I think a lot of I think of Kim Hill actually as someone who is could be seen as quite cynical sometimes in a good way in a healthy way but she's also I find when she asks around spiritual questions or something you feel this want to be told something else or like to be proven that there is maybe a goal yeah. or something so I think yeah there's this yeah. really interesting relationship between the two and maybe there are parts of each of us that are cynical and some and romantic and some yeah I mean I'm, I'm a very passionate person 
Mm. I think, you know, I kind of, you know, I can be very passionate about things that I love and also, you know, things that I hate. It's the way I approach, like, theatre. I mean, I would never want an audience member to come out of something kind of going, oh, what's for dinner or what's, what's, what am I going to do tomorrow, whatever, you know, come out indifferent in any way. I would rather somebody come out with a really strong opinion. Preferably like one of each on the same show. Like, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, that is my favourite thing. Yeah, I love arguing with people at the show. Like that actor was shit, but that one was really good. That well, no, like two people who come out and one person's like, that was awful, and the other person's going, oh, yeah. are you kidding? That, that was the was best amazing. thing I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. that happens yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Joe, I've got a quick opener for you, which is um, advantages and disadvantages of being friends with Jen. <laughs> advantages and disadvantages <laughs> of being friends with Jen. I made a really loud noise. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's interesting because um, I was thinking, Jen, about when we first met, which was in drama studies. I remember meeting you there and then you would be doing all this cool stuff out and it's like, Jen's doing this and Jen's doing that. And um, yeah, so it's been nice to get to meet you again over the Vic course a bit more and then now outside of that. Yeah. Like I just sort of avoided David's question, sort of reframed it for myself. That's a media technique. Another quick one for you, Joe, actually. Um, Before choosing a bowls club did you look at rugby clubs as well we did not look at anything else except the bowling club because it's three doors away from our house so it wasn't in any way like we set out to find a space it was just that the space was there that I knew how limited in the performing arts industry rehearsal spaces are everyone's rehearsing in their bedrooms a really common one at the moment is people working in their parents workplace um, like the top of the Westpac Tower Um, once everyone's gone home I really like that that people are sort of rehearsing these subversive shows in um, in boardrooms boardrooms, (laughs) if they're lucky enough to have a parent who works here Um, uh, so it was just that that space was available and yeah we we just slowly knocked on the door of of, um, the old bowlers and gradually over a few years got to take ownership of it so haven't looked at rugby clubs but I suspect they're not diminishing as fast as bowling clubs are. The other one for Joe, oh sorry for Heather, um, what's the most disgusting thing you've ever had to deal with whilst either running an event or venue? An obvious example being something like someone being a little bit ill on the floor or something. The sort of things that you would like to have forgotten but really stick in your mind. I can't think of anything. You haven't been box office manager at Bants, have you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I read the reports, though. That's a really fun thing. There was one report recently. I have to repeat this. It was very funny. Somebody had, somebody wrote in the show report, um, someone has vomited at least half a kebab into the propeller stage toilets. And I just thought that was the most wonderful thing. I love the specificity. Thing. I know. Yeah. It was so specific. Yeah, right. Like they'd done a forensic test um, and the follow up was that it had been disinfected. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have alerted you if it was less than a half but it is <laughs> at least a half so <laughs> at least on a procedural half. form yeah. yeah. So if we're looking for the rest of the, the, the kebab which yeah, are, it's less than half yeah. less than half around. <laughs> still in the building somewhere. <laughs> Maybe that's the smell. No. Oh god. Yeah. Oh, no. That made me laugh.